Welcome, everyone. Very happy to see you here today, although I can't be where with you in person. I'm Jambia Hilton. I'm the head of communications for Lenovo Asia Pacific. And I'm very happy to share with you the results of a study which we have just concluded uh, about students and educators in Asia Pacific, including India, of course, which we've called cracking the code for online learning. Now this study actually came about uh, from India because one of our colleagues uh, asked me, well, out of all of this, what do the students think about online learning? Um, and as a parent myself, as well as a, a Lenovo um, executive, I thought that was an interesting question again to ask, uh, not just asking the teachers, but asking the students themselves. So therefore, we did this study in conjunction with Microsoft, and we employed two professional agencies to do a study of 783 educators, and along with 669 parents and 1,935 students. Of those around a little bit more than 200 were in India. Now, by the way, these are students uh, more in secondary school and in uh, high school and, and in university rather than little kids. But it was an interesting, uh, interesting view of the entire Asia Pacific as opposed to just you know, somewhere else in the world. So let's take a look at what the results were. First of all, we had to look at the basics, how much online learning was really happening this past year. So what we found is perhaps unsurprisingly, during the pandemic, the proportion of students having online lessons was really, really rose tremendously between one year and the, and the last. So uh, where there was in the previous year, probably about half of the students had never, almost never had an online lesson. By the end of the year, 62% of them were having online lessons. And in some places, uh, it was really a tremendous high percentage, skewed a little bit about by uh, markets like Vietnam, where they had not been hard hit by the pandemic at that point. But most of the markets we surveyed were doing quite a lot of online learning, which they had never done before. Another thing that's very important to note here, and you'll see this coming up in the study again, is that the mode of learning is not all simultaneous or what we call a synchronous learning. So coming from a uh, at the office world where we often say we have a Zoom meeting, we have a Teams meeting. Um, quite a lot of the students were doing either a mix or sometimes even no synchronous learning at all. So that meant they were just getting the materials from the teacher, not in real time, no interaction with the teacher necessarily, and then having to send them back. So it's important to note that when we look at whether they were satisfied, how they felt about online learning, a lot of them were not doing the synchronous, but both the, syn the asynchronous or mix. Having said that, everyone was using more technology during the past year. Um, six in 10 students increased their use of technology by quite a lot, by 30%. And if you look at it um, among students and parents, 45% uh, increased their technology use of technology by almost half. So that's quite a lot, um, if you think about it, in a single year's time. Educators, even more so. Now, we did not interview educators in uh, India, or not enough to get, give a good sample size, but you can see a similar trend in markets like Malaysia, Indonesia, and Philippines. Their use of technology and work increased tremendously, with um, about three in four educators increased their use of technology by more than 50% in a single year, again, which is an enormous difference in, a, in a, such a short time. Um, and not surprisingly, they also spent on it. Now, as a company, we've been beneficiary, as have been some, other, uh, techno some others in the technology world. You'll see in 2021, so in the year up to May of, of uh, this year when the study was concluded, um, there was quite a big increase uh, overall in the amount of spending. Only a small amount of people uh, decreased. Most of them either uh, had the same amount of spending or they increased. In fact, 42% of students and parents increased their spending by at least 30% and an enormous amount. And what you see in the future is that this increase in spending is actually unlikely to change. Even the following year, the students and the parents um, predicted that around 66% of them said that their spending would go up. And educators, it was even more. So as we start to see this, our question is why? So they've already spent, they've already maybe got a laptop or a, or a tablet. So what is it that they still want to spend more on? In fact, some of these answers are becoming clear as we go through the study. 
And some of those come in to play when we look at the challenges of online learning. And it's not as simple as simply supplying the devices and saying like, okay, now I have a tablet, now I have a laptop, therefore I can do online learning. Um, so what does it mean when we look at the details? And uh, again, as a parent, I heard a lot of other parents and I heard a lot of kids complaining during the year. And this is myself, I'm based in Hong Kong, so which is a very you know, high technology adoption market. You know, a lot of the a lot of the kids were already using computers. So maybe it's just that they like to complain because when we looked at the results, it's not surprising to see that about a third of them thought that online learning did not allow them to have as good a result of education as before. And the parents were slightly more pessimistic than the students were. Um, so it's about 34% of students and parents or 32% students, 38% parents, thought that their learning performance was worse during online education compared to the previous year. But was perhaps a little bit surprising uh, compared to all the complaining we heard was that, uh, you know, just anecdotally speaking, was that around a third of them thought that it was the same. And actually another third thought that they did better on online learning than they ever had in the traditional learning, which is a fascinating uh, result. And when we start to look at the teachers, the educators, um, it's even more extreme. Uh, almost 60% of educators thought that their teaching performance improved during the last 12 months. Um, and only 17% uh, thought that it worse. Again, that is uh, part that can be partially explained by many diverse reasons. Um, you know, maybe teachers just like to think that their their teaching skills always getting better. But on the other hand, um, it seems significant that even in a year which is so dramatically impacted by the change, by that, that transition to online learning, and in a situation where a lot of them weren't even using synchronous learning, but we're using asynchronous learning, that um, that, that change is so, so dramatic. And uh, by the way, I also wanted to mention that in a market which is somewhat similar to India, in the, only in the sense that it's very big and very diverse, a lot of different languages and a lot of different locations, um, probably the greatest improvement was seen in Indonesian schools. Uh, so this is something to think about. What would be the implications of having a big diverse market and enabling the teachers um, to teach to all of these different methods using all of these different uh, technologies available to them, turns out that the result was maybe a little bit better than the common, common word on the street would have it. Yeah. Or maybe teenagers just like to complain. Having said that, what were the challenges? And the biggest ones, interestingly, was not that, oh, I didn't know how to use the computer, or I didn't you know how to use the available technology. Let's take a look at India, for example. Only 10% of the students said they had trouble using the technology. Now, the kids will be fine. They know how to use the tech. No, it was something quite different. Um, it was distractions at home. So we had 55% in India, which is quite comparable, I say, say to the rest of Asia Pacific found that distractions at home were the most common challenge they experienced. Um, motivation, of course, uh, you know, when there's no teacher breathing down your neck, then uh, you can't see the teacher. So we had 51% um, of, the, of the students saying that this was, a, this was an issue. Lack of immediate feedback and interaction. Remember what I said a minute ago about uh, asynchronous versus synchronous learning. So this, this lack of immediate feedback and interaction was seen across the board. 38% um, in India. The social isolation, which everybody has experienced during the pandemic and continues to do so now. Yes, we had some uh, level of difficulty with poor internet access, um, some level of difficulty with insufficient teaching support. And uh, another one which I want to point out here, a little bit higher in India than the average was 34% said that they had difficulty in accessing study materials at home, such as textbooks which uh, we'll see in another moment why that looks like an interesting topic and why we should remember that. Some people had uh, difficulty in finding space at home, um, which uh, I expected that, again, myself being from Hong Kong, we have tiny little apartments, I thought that would be more of an issue, but that tended to be quite similar all across the board. 
Uh, lack of appropriate devices, um, I want to keep in mind that the study was actually done online as well. So this might be a little bit skewed because the people who are answering the survey already had a device, obviously. Nevertheless, you can see that there was a, a range, but it wasn't the top, um, it wasn't the top challenge. And then finally, um, a point at the, at the bottom, that the need to share the use of device with parents or other household members did show up as being uh, not the highest, but it was definitely on the list for India, a little bit higher than in other markets. Um, I think only Philippines was higher, 19%. So in India, that was 13%. So these challenges um, are something that we all had to think about during the year. But we also should think about what are the uh, implications of these challenges? What does it mean? Where do we come from? Where does this challenge affect us? Now, taking a look at the educators. Now, again, we didn't have a very high level of, of uh, Indian educators responding to the survey, so we didn't break out the data, but there are some in here. And I think we can also take a look at some of the comparable countries, such as Indonesia and Malaysia, which have similar challenges, multiple languages, very large geographic areas. And you can see that it's just the flip side of what the students said. The students get distracted or lose concentration, and they specifically mentioned during live sessions, but uh, I think that's all the time. Social isolation was a big one, because remember, teachers are people too. They need the interaction of their students. A lot of teachers have gone into the profession because they generally love working with students, working face to face. Now, a very interesting one was that we saw as a much bigger issue with the teachers of learning how to adjust to a new platform or adjusting to a new platform, much bigger than it was for the students. So I think we can make a few stereotypes here, right? The students are very adaptable. Kids know how to adjust. They're very, a lot of them are what we call digital natives. Teachers, a little bit, it was a little bit more difficult to make that jump. Um, and uh, we also see that the teachers had difficulty in delivering the content effectively during e-learning. So that is a learning itself, how to deliver content during e-learning. And something that as a technology company, we are looking at now, how do we make, um, make that better and easier for teachers? Um, one point that uh, I wanted to share on difficulty of providing feedback to students, um, this may also go with the asynchronous versus synchronous learning. And along with that, uh, something which we really need to consider, which is how do the students and the teachers share information? So it's not only in the live classroom setting, you know, just those of us uh, who are in the education profession or who remember being students ourselves or parents, you know, a lot of the learning happened outside the classroom or through homework or through assignments or studying for tests, study groups, all of these things um, and getting that individual feedback uh, from from teachers is very important for us for a student. Yes, we did find in some cases they also had insufficient devices or equipment to support the teachers when working from home. Um, although, as we'll see, most of them did uh, end up using a laptop. Uh, there's not always, you know, that's not everything. There's there's more to it. Uh, some of them did actually have to bear the cost of purchasing or subscribing to e-learning platforms. Although sometimes that's borne by the school, there was also a con uh, concern about the cost of whether that would um, whether that would uh, provide the benefit that they were really looking for. Um, there was also a lack of appropriate uh, e-learning platforms and technical support. This showed up not as the number one concern, but it was it was there. And then finally, um, restricted access. So document sharing is, I think, always a, an ongoing issue in any shared or collaborative environment. Um, so just it is for teachers, just it is for office workers, I think everybody around the world. So you can see as well that there's a difference between um, the different markets, but the trends tend to be the same. And when you look at the difference between even the kindergarten or primary or secondary school teachers versus the edu educators working at local colleges or universities, they're actually not that different, um, which I thought was very interesting because I would have expected the younger teachers, or sorry, teachers of younger students to have be answering this in a slightly different way. But as it turns out, they were, they were quite similar across the board. Now, here's one of the questions I thought was the most interesting. When something goes wrong, what do you do? And when encountering technical issues during e-learning, 
it looks like about a third of the students would actually go to their friends, their classmates, their siblings, or adults in the household, or just solve it themselves. Almost the last one on the list was going to the technical support staff. And uh, if you look at that, uh, nearly a third of them are asking other young people. And this is something very interesting because it gives us another insight into one of the distractions that we saw earlier. The kids are taking up another burden, and that is as the IT support for their friends, for themselves, or even, if we look on the other side, for the household. Because even the educators, who would tend to ask the technical support staff a little bit beforehand, um, that was, that's, their first, uh, be, that's their first port of call, would be the tech support staff. 11% of them ask the kids. So if you're, you know, if you're a teacher in a household with a teenager, you may readily ask your own students or you may ask your own teenager, you know, come and fix this for me. And uh, so there we have behind the scenes an entire cadre of young people who are acting as the tech support for the household, for the school even. Now, having said that, they're not, they're not the only ones who are doing it. We also saw parents' involvement or other adult household members for the students at nearly 33%. Um, we saw the teachers having to act as, tech, act as tech support or other school administrators at 23%. And yes, around 15% um, would be the tech, school technical support staff. And of course, also a lot of the students went to the search engines and find the answer for themselves. Um, the saddest one, I think, is this 2% who just said, I'll leave the issue unfixed. Among the educators, we saw around 46% of them would go to the tech support staff. Um, and they would often ask other teachers, they would ask their spouse, another adult household member. As I mentioned, they asked the kids, or they also are a favorite, uh, their favorite of finding the answer themselves through a search engine, or that 1% who just leave it unfixed. So uh, having, having looked at this, I, we have to question, um, why is it that they don't go to the tech support staff who in theory should be their first port of call? So this is something that the tech, uh, the, technology providers like ourselves have to think about how can we support both students and educators in getting the technical support they need, or are they satisfied with this solution already? And how do we reduce the burden on both the students as well as the teachers in providing that technical support? Now that's kind of the bad news. How I want to look a little bit the opposite side of the coin. What is the good news? What are the opportunities uh, that we found through this study and why this is only the beginning. And one of the most interesting things is that we found both students and parents um, really found a lot of advantages of e-learning. So one of the biggest ones was that it's accessible from the comfort of home and saves the time. And I don't think anybody likes commuting and anybody who's been stuck in a traffic jam really anywhere all over Asia, but India is no different. Um, knows that if you can avoid the commute, that would be fantastic. Uh, having said that, there's also some other things to think about. Flexibility and self-paced learning. This is not something that only can happen during a pandemic. Now, this is something that can happen any time. Uh, a lot of them found technical skills that they never knew they had. 34% said that they helped, the online learning helped build technical skills for digital learning. And this is among the students and parents, right? Uh, one thing that was very interesting to me is that look at India, 32%, so nearly a third. So this allowed them greater level of personalization when it came to uh, learning and support. So how do you get that? Uh, how do you grapple with the fact that you may be in a student, uh, maybe a student in a class full of other students, but you only you have the unique learning needs? How do you get that support that you need? As it turns out, online, online learning does actually help with that. Um, improves virtual communication and collaboration. And uh, again, we saw nearly a quarter of students in India, 23%, said that they were able to access uh, teaching from all over the world. So if you think about it, if you are sitting at home and you're connected by the internet, you don't need to think about uh, this, the teacher is um, like one kilometer away or a thousand kilometers away or on the other side of the world entirely. Um, they, they're all the same. The, the, world is, the world is completely flat, you might say. And around 20% of them did say that it improved uh, collaborative learning or level of engagement. Um, although the, 
the responses to that varied quite a lot. We saw that in markets like Japan and Korea, uh, only around 77 or 8 percent thought that was the case. Um, and by the way, I thought it was quite interesting that out of all these places who were complaining about the traffic, uh, Singapore was um, very much the highest, saying that uh, saves, saving the time on the commute. But actually, Singapore traffic's not that bad compared to a lot of places. So maybe this is uh, some social commentary as well. Along with this, let's look at what the educators said. Again, similar, they, educators also don't like to commute. Um, they, around 67% said that uh, that was their, their biggest uh, advantage of, of online learning. And here's a very interesting one, that it's centralized teaching materials in one easily accessible online resource, which is quite interesting because if you think about that, and there's nothing preventing you from doing that during traditional teaching as well. Same thing with the students. They said it allows for more personalized learning and support. Look at it from the teacher's point of view. If you have a class of 30, 40, even more kids, how do you, how do you personalize your teaching? And the online environment allows that. Um, collaborative learning, um, or for example, agile and being agile in administration, 49%, so almost half of the uh, educators thought that this was an advantage of online learning. So for example, the ability to update all the learning materials simultaneously without, I guess, having to go to the, um, to the photocopy or the mimeograph machine uh, in the old days or to resend the materials by, by email. Now, one of the other in very interesting areas we saw is that the materials, sorry, the technology that the students and the educators were using, um, you might say that, okay, they all had a laptop. So that was on students at around 70, say around three quarters of them had a laptop, another quarter of them used a tablet, a small handful used a, uh, said they used a Chromebook, um, and the educators, I think almost all of them used a laptop. But what they didn't have, I think it's just as interesting as what they did have. We saw that only about 38% of them were actually using a video conferencing app. So quite a lot of them would have been accessing teacher interaction through asynchronous uh, methods, as opposed to the synchronous methods which uh, we believe could um, try to try to overcome that, that feeling of disconnectivity or, or loneliness. On the other hand, um, cloud-based document sharing, only about 20 of the students, the 20% of the students were using this. Uh, even the ones who had uh, made trouble connecting, only about 19% of them were using a monitor. And a more sophisticated learning management system platform, only about 16%. Remote access files, only about 14%. So all of these together show just as much what is yet to come and what can be, um, you know, can be taken advantage of by both the students and the educators. Now, the educators, um, again, this is a little bit of a different market skew, so we can't compare it directly to the students. But we see that um, relatively, relatively more of them are, do have a, we're using a video conferencing app, but by far from all of them. So that's a, that was really surprising to us because we thought, you know, the world is on Zoom, the world is on Teams, the world is on Google Meet. Um, and yet it wasn't just universally true for online education. Um, only about uh, just over half were using document sharing in the cloud. Um, only 36% were using remote access files. A lot of these things uh, are very, I would say, almost basic um, options for online learning, which are still yet to be taken advantage of by so many educators and by students in Asia Pacific. So there's a huge opportunity there. So to close, let me give you a little bit of food for thought. Um, one of the questions that we really had after this study, after conducting this study, would be how to ask how can educators, students, and parents make better use of online learning um, as a supplement to or as part of traditional education modes, rather than as a one-for-one -one, um, replacement or a substitute. Because you don't have to just say, okay, there's a pandemic and then we can never go back to the old way. The new way is quite likely to be something which is neither traditional nor online, but something entirely new, a hybrid that doesn't resemble either one of those. Along with that, we are wondering ourselves, what will wider adoption of the existing tools? And we're not talking about some futuristic tools that might be developed in the, you know, someday. These are tools that exist right now. Things like video conferencing, things like document sharing. What will these mean for the future of online learning? Will they help to tackle some of the challenges you saw? 
a very interesting question, which is now looking a little bit more in the future. What are the implications of online learning for educational inclusivity? For example, are there places where the girls tend to not go out of the house as much while the boys go out of the house more? Does this mean with the adoption of more online learning as part of the curriculum, would that allow the girls to access education even more than before? Or alternatively, could there be a downside? For example, if there's more technology in education, does it mean that, for example, the, the boy will get to use the, the laptop and the girl, you know, the brother will get to use the laptop and the, and the sister won't? On the other side, uh, again, let's talk about what happens for people who have limited mobility, whether that's students, whether that's teachers, whether that's parents. Um, can they use the power of technology to access learning environments, to become part of the learning community, which maybe they've never been able to do in the past. We have uh, stories already of uh, parents who, during the pandemic, were finally able to join the Parent Teacher Association because it was online, but they'd never been able to do so before because they were confined to a house. And these, these types of things uh, really open up doors to think about how can inclusivity be encouraged or even made possible by technology. So this is a, an area yet to explore. So just to a little reminder, you see on the side, online learning is not new, but the technology we use absolutely is. So here's a picture of uh, students um, during the polio epidemic of 1937 attending radio school lessons. So the, the concept is not, uh, concept is absolutely not something that's, that's new, but I would like to see how we can all together crack the code of online learning and make and bring smarter technology for all. So thank you very much. And I hope you have a great rest of the conference.